Welcome to another sermon from All People Christian Church. It is our hope that this message will encourage, inspire, and challenge you in your walk with God. All right, part three now. Let's go to this. I am doing part three today of our current sermon series entitled, let's read that together. Amen. In part three today, first week we just talked about money and finances in general and what does the bible have to say about it which is a lot and why does god care so much about money and its relationship to us and we saw that it's because where our treasure is jesus said is where our heart will also be too and our time and our attention right then last week we looked at the many wonderful amazing and can't be bested principles from the bible on how to steward or to manage the finances that God's given you. And you're like, well, I'm a poor student or I'm just a newly career starting single person. I don't have a lot of money. Yes, you do. By the world standards, if you live in America, you are wealthy, okay? Unless you are living on the street or something like that. You are wealthy by the world standards. You have plenty that you're responsible for. And we learned three things last week that we need to stay out of debt, amen? And if you're in debt, get out as fast as you can and stay out. Number two, you need to save some of what you earn. The Bible says only a fool spends everything they have. And then thirdly, maybe most importantly, is you need to have the B word, a a budget. Yes, and that's not just for rich people. In fact, rich people are the only ones who can possibly get away with not having a budget because they can waste their money and still have something left. If you are not exceedingly wealthy, then you need a budget more than anybody. I had my kids as teenagers start doing a budget, and now that they're in their 20s and making their own finances and getting their own paychecks, they are so grateful to have a budget because it's helping them to do what they need to do. Amen? So those are the three things we need to do, but you can't do a sermon series, at least a four-week one, of which we're into the third week, You can't do one without talking about the most obvious issue of our possessions in the Bible, and that is the issue of giving. Can you say giving? Yeah, that's exactly it. God's plan, what is it, and then what are his principles for giving? This is so vast and so rich, it's going to take me the last two weeks, the second two weeks of this, the next two weeks, I mean, to cover this entire topic, but today I'll cover this part of it. So go to the opening here. Here's what I want to say in the introduction. Put that first one up, please. Our God, okay, the God we serve is a giving God, you've got to understand. So when we give, we're just trying to be more like him. And that's what he wants, amen? And if you don't believe me, look at the most famous verse from the entire Bible. Put that up there. John 3, 16. Okay? Tim Tebow used to wear it when he played NFL football on his little sticker under his eyes. You'll see it on T-shirts and banners and signs at major sporting events, etc. It says, for God, our God, so loved the world, the world that actually hated him and had been living in rebellion, whom he could have written off, like when your kids rebel and you go, I don't want these kids anymore. Somebody adopt them for me. No. God didn't disregard us. He gave not a little bit of money from all the world's riches. He didn't give, you know, even his right arm. He gave something far more valuable. His only begotten son. Why? So that whoever believes in him should not perish eternally and go to hell but have an everlasting life and live with God in paradise for all of time. Amen? That's a giving God. Go to this next slide. The point I'm making is this. He set the highest possible standard that can be given for giving. For giving. The highest standard. So you will never give too much in your lifetime. And you'll never come within a universe of giving God back what he gave to us i mean think about it if i asked you to write a check today for a charitable cause that we're we're doing or just for the church in general you might be like i'm feeling generous today i'm going to do that i'm an amazing giver and then i'd be like also can i have your firstborn child 
too. Would you mind sacrificing them as well, for God's sake? And you'd be like, come on, man, there's limits here. All right, I'm not Abraham. I'm not going to, you know, offer up my child that I waited all these years for just because God asked me to, which he ended up doing, by the way. And then God said, don't worry, I just wanted to make sure you're willing. No. But if I did that, you'd be like, you're crazy. Is this a cult or what is this, you know? And I'd say, no, I'm just saying that's how much God gave. He didn't give a little of what he had or most even of what he had. He gave everything. He gave himself. Amen. Go to the next slide here. I want you to see this. Oh, those are our announcements. So that's cool. But you got a sneak peek on those. So check those out. But I want you to know this. If you're still lacking motivation to give, keep this in mind. Giving is the only eternal deposit you'll ever make into anything. You know, when you get your paycheck, hopefully even automatically it gets deposited into your checking account, right? So that like a friend of mine who used to work mostly off tips and they were in the form of cash back then, she used to come home and she had this big wad of cash and she'd end up spending it all the time because it was there and it was available. The problem is that was half her income, you know? So you hopefully make deposits all the time to keep your money safe and not let it be lost or wasted, right? Yeah, but here's the problem. Everything that you deposit in this lifetime, no matter how much or how little it is, in the end, it'll be gone. The pharaohs are wrong of Egypt. You're not taking anything with you. No, the only thing you take with you is what you gave away in this life. Look at what it said in 1 Timothy when Paul wrote to him. He said, after all, Timothy, we brought how much? How much? Nothing is the right answer, not all. Nothing with us when we came into the world, right? You see a newborn baby, no clothes, no wallet, no Instagram account, nothing. They got nothing, right? You're going to leave, it says, the same way. We can't take anything, say anything, with us when we leave this world. Except the Bible teaches what Jesus said, and that is the eternal impact and deposits that you made. By giving to God and others. Amen? That's what you get to keep. So go to this next slide, please. And let me finish that point. This whole concept of giving is easier to do, though, when you realize that at the end of the day, you're only a steward anyways. See, like he just said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 7, he said, look, everything you have in this life, the clothes on your body, the money in your bank account, and even your own children, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your family, your parents, your brothers, it's all on loan. That car you drive, that's not yours. It's God's. Everything you are, the heart inside your chest that's beating, the lungs that breathe in and out and give you the ability to live, it's all a gift from God. So you are actually never even giving. All you're doing is stewarding or sharing back with the one who gave it all to you, the Bible says what he's already given you. In fact, really, we shouldn't talk about how much should you give, what percentage. We should talk about how much is appropriate to keep. If I lent you everything I owned and then I came to Connor and said, hey, Connor, I need to use that this week. Can I get that back from you? And he's like, "Mm, nah, not sure. I'd be like, bro, I I lent that to you. Okay, that's actually mine. I'm not asking. I'm just telling you that I need this. Yeah, but I want to hold on to it. And yet we do that with God all the time. He's like, will you tithe and give me your first 10%? We're like, "Mm, that's a lot. Not sure. He's like, you wouldn't even have it if I hadn't given it to you. I just need to know that you understand that, so give it to me. And yet we struggle. And we're only borrowing anyway. So I hope that makes an impact on you. So let's go into this, guys. When it comes to giving, there's three things that I'm going to ask you to consider today. And all of these, by the way, can I see that real quick under your water bottle there? All of these are in the brand new Bible study that we're finishing here today, this week, right now. We've been working on a series called By the Book, okay? We have the original one called Relationships by the Book, which every single person in our church or outside of our church needs to do this Bible study. Whether you're 15 years old, I'd say about that'd be about 13 maybe, the starting age. 
up to however old you are and still single or divorced, wanting to remarry, whatever it may be, you need to do this study. And then if you have ever heard of LGBTQ or anything going on in our culture like gender fluidity and uh, gender dysmor uh, dys uh, dysphoria, uh, all these words I got to memorize now. I mean, if you are in any way, shape or form either dealing with some of these issues yourself, like, you know, what gender am I supposed to be really or who am I attracted to? Am I pansexual? Am I bisexual? Am I homosexual, heterosexual, what am I, am I cisgender, am I this, am I that, whatever you may be dealing with or whatever you're afraid to talk about as a Christian because you don't want to get blasted by your friends or fired at work or torn apart on the internet or you lack the confidence to talk to a friend about it and still be honest and yet loving, which I found when I'm honest and loving, I can disagree with people and they will still come and visit my church because they want to be somewhere that's honest and loving, then you should do this gender and sexuality by the book, uh, Bible study. And then last but not least, this one that's even a little thicker we've been doing because it's so vast, it's called Finances by the Book. It's all about everything we're teaching on. And this one, speaking of finances, is still the final draft version it says on there. So we're, we're giving these away for $5 each at our table just to recoup the cost. And then we're going to print, hopefully by next Sunday, our first edition. So if you want to get the discount version, get that today and go on back there. Amen? All right, that's my commercial plug. I just figured I'll use my sermon to do a quick infomercial on these uh, Bible studies here and let you know that you need to do all three if you haven't already. But here's the deal. When it comes to giving, we need to ask question number one. Put it up there. How much? Say how much. How much should we give? Or if I really properly rephrased it, it would be how much should I even think of keeping of what God has lent to me? Amen? You know, I was talking earlier about kids. I didn't have to offer up my firstborn child to God like Abraham did or like God himself did to us when he gave of himself God the Son. But I will tell you this, that my kids have all now officially moved out and it is emotionally brutal especially for my poor wife I mean once a day I think she might cry just when she thinks about how these babies are all gone and you'll be there one day too many of you and I'm here to tell you that you have to let them go because if you don't figure it out they'll let you know like I don't want you telling me anymore everything that I need to do I'm going to make those decisions on my own thank you very much and I've got my own paycheck now so you got no leverage over Okay, so I've lost all that now. Now I'm just an advisor hoping they might listen to some of my advice. Right, guys? You know what I mean? So this is what happens when you become an empty nester. So once that, once that money runs out, you got nothing left, you know? And it's just, may I offer an idea? You know, <laughs> stuff like that. So I'm here to tell you, you got to let everything go at some point. Amen? The best way to live this life is with your hands like this, not like this. See what I'm saying? So how much should we give? Let's go into this. All right, the answer, hello, start with the most famous Bible word about giving. It's called the tithe. Say the tithe. The tithe in both the Hebrew of the Old Testament language and the Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, both of them have a word for tithe, and both of them mean exactly the same thing, 10%. It's not ambiguous. It's not random. It's not cryptic, which means mysterious and hard to figure out. No, it is 10%. Look at Leviticus when this was first. Oh, and I'm sorry, I meant to do the drum roll part. The tithe, by the way, forgive me, it's the beginning of what we should give. And I'm going to explain why that is the case. Because one of the most popular uh, topics out there on the internet today that all the armchair theologians uh, who ha are convinced that they've figured something out and that every pastor is evil, every church is money grubbing, every uh, dollar you give to God and to the church is some kind of act of magnanimous awesomeness, you know, or something like that. No, I'm here to tell you that 10% even for those of us under the new covenant in the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law, is really the, the beginning. 
It's just where you're starting to get. Amen? And I'll explain more of what I mean by that as we go along. So go to this verse here out of Leviticus. Back under the Old Covenant, when it was first being introduced to the children of Israel through Moses, as uh, Kathleen was talking about earlier when she did the first sermon, and I'm doing the second one. I'm kidding. I was teasing her. I teased her. That was pretty awesome and insightful. Um, no, Leviticus chapter 27. Here's what God was explaining in this very detailed book of Leviticus that gives very detailed descriptions of each aspect of the law, from the ceremonial aspects to the diet to the ownership of land to how you treat people and money. He said one-tenth of the produce of the land. Say one-tenth. That's the tithe. Whether it's grain from the fields or fruit from your trees, because most of them were you know, living in an agricultural type of commerce society back then. All of it, that first 10%, it belongs to who? Who? Yeah, and must be set apart to him as holy. See, under the old covenant, it, w it was a legalistic obligation. You were to follow the law. That's how you follow God. And there was no compromising or bending the rules or saying, I don't feel led to do it. You just did it. And then he said, count off every tenth animal from your herds. So they would literally have these animals coming up. And then the tenth one, boom, that's going to be God's. And it can't be one of the defective animals either. It's got to be the best. And set that apart as holy to the Lord. Amen. Go to this next slide here. And you'll see what I'm talking about. When we say how much should we give, if the answer is a tithe, then look at this. You may ask, what are offerings in? Because I often hear this phrase, tithes and offerings, right? Aren't they the same thing? Yes and no. Here's what I mean. Every time you give to God, even a tenth, you're giving him an offering, right? Every time you sing to God, every time you give up your time to make it to church, you're giving God an offering of yourself. Your time, your talents, your treasures, right? But when you're talking about tithes and offerings, you're talking about offerings being anything other than that first 10%. Or if you're giving less than that, something leading up to it. It's still an offering. But I often have people go, yeah, I just started tithing 2%. And I'm like, that is awesome that you're giving 2%. But that's not tithing 2%, okay? Until you get to 10, that's not a tithe. It's an offer, amen, or anything above the tithe, which is what my wife and I try to give. And even as a church, we tithe off our tithes back into the body of Christ. We want to also give more than that in offering and not just stop at 10, amen. So go to this next slide here. Let me explain. What is the tithe for them? Why is God so adamant about this first 10% and him saying, make sure you don't hold that first 10% back? And keep it to yourself. Why? Well, under the old and the new covenant, it goes for these things. The needs of the church, or back under the old covenant, that would be the temple and the storehouse and the Levites and the priests. And nowadays, it's pastors and churches and uh, uh, staff that serve or the, the work and service that the church is providing to you and to the community. That's what the first part goes to of this tent. Let me show you here. Go to this scripture in Deuteronomy. He said, you must set aside a tithe of your crops. Now, it talks about this all through the Old Covenant. One-tenth, how much? One-tenth of all the crops you harvest each year. So they didn't walk around with paper money or digital, you know, cryptocurrency or anything like that back then. It said, bring this tithe to the designated place of worship. That would have been where you go to church, right? The place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored and here was the deal. This was during uh, a description he was giving of the festivals. Check this out. He says, and then eat the tithe there in his presence. You're like, wait, why am I eating what I'm giving? Because you don't realize when you tithe, let's say, to your local church, you're sitting here today benefiting from what you and others have given. Did you know how the rent to meet here gets paid? Did you know how the equipment we're using to push service on gets paid for through what you're giving. So you're even eating and consuming from the very thing you're giving because you serve an amazing God. Amen. He said, doing this, check it out. Why? Why do it? It will teach you to always fear the Lord your God. 
and don't neglect the Levites in your town. The Levites were the workers for God's temple and storehouses that served the priests. They were basically the staff. And they were the ones who were told by God, you are not allowed to have a secular job. You will only make a living off the giving of God's people. And in like Malachi chapter 3, when God had to rebuke the children of Israel because they weren't giving their tithes, he said, and now my Levites have had to leave the temple and go find work out there because you guys weren't doing your job. Churches have shut down most commonly because they run out of money. And you're like, oh, well, they shouldn't have been asking for it in the first place. Really? It's not what the Bible says. But that would be the worst reason I could ever think of for our church to shut down. I, I pray that will never happen in our lifetimes. Amen? What a sad tragedy. Talk about something that could have been avoided. It says, and don't neglect them because they receive no allotment of land among you. You know, I was prepared when I was getting ready to graduate from college. I was going to make a boatload of money. I mean a lot. I majored in business sales communication. And I had already, when my six-figure income would start by age 25, by age 30, back then, you know, 30-something, I was going to be making minimum 300 grand a year, and I had all these goals all laid out. Man, I don't even make that money now. I'm 55. I mean, I gave up all of that so that I could serve God, and God's like, and every time I got desperate or scared and tried to get a, a different job as a Starbucks manager or something like that, the door would shut. Even though I had qualifications and a resume, God would be like, nope, you're going to keep living off of the giving of my people. I command it. And God has done that. You know how many times I've run out in 35 years? Zero. A couple times came real close, but zero. Amen? So let's go to the next one. The tithe is also God's plan for providing for the needs of God's occupational, a.k.a. pastors, missionaries, uh, the church admin staff, whatever, occupational workers, the Levites and the priests of the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. Look at this. It said this in, go there, 1 Corinthians 9. Now, this is out of the New Testament. This is Paul the Apostle, who is a Jew, an Israelite himself, descendant of Abraham, a Hebrew, he's writing to the New Testament church in Corinth in chapter 9 and says, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle. Going back to the law and connecting it to the New Testament and the New Covenant. He says, you're not supposed to muzzle one of your oxes while it's treading out the grain. Don't put a muzzle on because the oxen eats the grain as it's doing the work. In other words, if you do a job somewhere... You expect them to pay you, don't you? Yeah, well, who, wh what is a pastor who had to spend 10 years getting a seminary degree like I did or, or has to work, you know, all week long, 80 hours a week trying to get, you know, church taken care of and the people in it taken care of and the poor admin staff that works there doing, you know, twice as amount of work for half the pay that they would normally get out in the secular realm or whatever. Where are they supposed to get paid? By the church. How are the rent and the bills to get paid? By the church. That's how God set it up. He said, don't you know that those who minister the holy things eat of the very things of the temple? Where did the Levites go grocery shopping? At the storehouse of the temple. That's where they did their grocery shopping. He said, and those who serve at the altar were even allowed to partake of some of the food that was offered to God. Because he said, this is how I'll provide for you. Even so, the Lord has what? commanded people like Brett Holman who preached the gospel to live from the gospel. Oh, it would be so much easier if I didn't have to rely on people. If I could just get out there and make it happen on my own, which I'm more than willing to do. I can outwork just about anybody. I'll do it. I'll get out there. My mom taught us that. My brother works hard. It'd just be easier if I could be like, hey, I need a little more. I'm going to get out there and make it happen. But God says no not going to let it happen you need to trust me and live by faith so i've had a team of financial supporters as a career missionary for over 30 years some of them have been with me that entire time they now have great grandchildren and i met their kids when their kids were toddlers and they've been with me that whole time 
And I could not have planted two churches with no salary at the beginning of the whole process, etc. And still into our church plant to this day, in many cases, I could not have done that without trusting God to provide through people. Isn't that amazing? So go to this next one. It's also free for the needs of the needy as God's church. Did you know that the church is not supposed to just receive a bunch of giving and then keep it? It's supposed to send it back out and recycle it. We've had people, just last week I gave somebody a gift, a small gift of things we had to offer at the church. I had somebody recently who was in a a financial situation and the little bit of money we had in our family relief fund, I had to give it to this person with a legitimate need. And we, we tithe and give above our tithe off of what comes into our church to support, I think, seven different missionaries, several different ministries, the parent organization that we're part of, all of this stuff. In other words, God wants to use the church to be the place that people can come to, just like my friends in, in the Mormon faith and religion, what they do is they have so much money in their local wards and in the the whole structure of the Mormon organization that nobody in their wards, in their local places, would ever, ever go hungry. And if someone is without a job, they are taken care of by that church. That is how the Christian church is supposed to do it. Amen? But you know what? You come to a lot of churches, 9 out of 10 of them, and you're like, I need money. I get literally 2 to 3 requests a week from even total strangers for money. You know, man, I lost all my money at this or that, or what? can you guys help me out? And I have to 99% of the time say no. Because I'm like, we're just trying to pay our bills, let alone having all this extra to give out above what we're already giving. That's not how it's to be. The Bible teaches us this. It says, go to this next one, actually, and I'll read it. It says, at the end of every third year, so this was about the festivals as well. He says, bring the entire tithe of that year's harvest and store it in the nearest town. Why? So it would be available when someone like an orphan or a widow, it says, would need it. Say, give it to the Levites. So in other words, entrust it to the church leaders. Oh, I don't trust those crooked people. They're all criminals. They're all, I knew that one guy bought a Learjet with that money I gave. Really, the $5 you gave, he bought that Learjet? No, I don't think so. Okay, as well as to who? The foreigners living among you? Immigrants. God cares about immigrants. He said the orphans who don't have a family. He said the widows in your town so that they can eat and be satisfied. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all your work. In other words, and again, I'm racing through all this because we go into much more detail in this Bible study that you need to do to learn all this. And it's this. The Bible teaches that first and foremost, every human being that you see living on the street or whatever is supposed to turn to God for help. Then they're to turn to the family. And if the family doesn't care for them, then their last resort is to turn to the church. Or not last resort, the next one. And the church, which is caring for families, should ideally have enough left over to help whoever needs it, especially within their own flock. And then last but not least, as a last resort, you're to go to a secular entity like the government. But do you know where we go first in our society? The government first, God last. <laughs> no wonder the government's so humongous and taxes are so high. And we almost defaulted on our debt. Because we are paying for a lot of people. The government is doing the churches and the families' jobs. Amen? God wants to change that. So, go to the next slide here. Second question, to whom? Say, to whom? To whom should we give? Okay. If you're telling me I give beginning place... 10% and work from there. Do you know there's people in the world who literally give up to 90% of their income? Mother Teresa, who raised billions, say billions, that's a lot. So much she raised that if she had withdrawn all the money that was given to her missionaries of charity, it would have bankrupt the Vatican Bank, they said. And yet she lived on 1% or less of everything she ever did. That's given. So, to whom should we give? Well, good question. I'll say this. Put this first one up there. Number one, first and foremost, to God. In other words, we call the giving time of our service an act of worship. We'll say we're going to continue our worship service through giving. 
Because giving should not be like, oh, it's business time. All right, the church is broke. I'm just going to need to give. Okay, yeah. But they're going to ask every week anyway, so it's uncomfortable. I'll just go ahead and give something so they'll get off my case, you know. So here's a little money I had left over, tip. You know, God, here's a little tip for you. The valet parked my car. You know, no, you're giving to God, man. Every time, well, I used to write checks. Many of you don't know what those are. Uh, there's these things that you can write on and you can hand them and use them as notes of promise. Uh, anyone under 30 doesn't know what I'm talking about. So, But these checks for us middle-agers, you know, I used to write in the memo section on it, Malachi 3, 10 through 12, or some kind of scripture verse, to remind myself that I was always giving to God. See, that's what you want to know. Look at this verse of scripture here. It says in Proverbs 3, 9 out of the God's Word translation, Honor the Lord with what? Your wealth. I'm not wealthy. Yes, you are. If you have a dollar to your name that isn't already spent, you're wealthy. Okay? And with the what? First and the best part of all your income. Man, under the old covenant, you tried to give God one of your leftover sheep, one of the old funky ones with, you know, a broken leg and, you know, uh, all kinds of messed up skin or whatever. God would be offended and rejected. Because he's like, really? I gave you the whole flock and you're going to give me the ugly stuff? But see, that's how we usually give. Like, oh, is there a goodwill around? I just got all this junk I don't want. I'm just going to give all that away. It's like, no, God wants the best we have. Amen? So, go to the next part here. To whom should we give? Secondly, to God's house. To God's house. That didn't start in the church days. That started way back under the old covenant. In fact, look at the famous passage from Malachi 3.10. Here's Malachi the prophet, the last one who wrote in the Old Testament about 400 years before it went silent till the advent of Jesus. And he is rebuking the socks off of God's people. He's like, you guys have been intermarrying with the wrong people. You've been getting divorced and not treating um, marriage as holy and sanctimonious as, I, as God does. And here's another one, if that isn't worse. If that isn't bad enough, he says, and by the way, you have been withholding your tithes and your offerings from God, and now the temple is run down, and the Levites who work there are off working in the fields and getting other secular jobs because you have been, the Bible says, robbing from me. He said, that's mine, and you're robbing from me. He said, as a result, there's a curse over your whole land. He said, you want to break the curse? Start giving me the first 10% and beyond, and I'll open the windows of heaven. I'll bless you so much, you won't even be able to keep track of how much I bless you with. So he said, bring all the tithes. How much? All the tithes into the storehouse, which was the treasury of the temple, so that there will be enough food. For who? For the Levites, the workers, the orphans, the widows, and everyone else they were to serve. In his what? In his temple. So the temple was the church, basically. The storehouse was the bank account, if you want to call it that. And he was saying, it's falling apart, falling short of budget, and it's your fault, people of God, for not giving. Man, if we lived in Malachi's day, he, you don't want to hear one of his messages on giving. It'd be pretty intense. He'd be like, all right, pull your, pull your bank account up on your phone right now. I'm going through here. I'm checking each one of you. You'd be like, well, it's not the, you know, there are certain uh, not Christian churches doing that. Well, not that I know of, but uh, other religions I know of that have done that. But no, God says, look, I'm going to wait on you, but you can obey or disobey. Amen. Look at number three. Who's the third one we give to? God's workers. God's workers. Yeah, go to this verse here. It says in Numbers 18.21, as for the tribe of Levi that came down through Aaron... He said, your relatives, I've set these guys aside, the whole tribe, to work for me full time. I'll compensate them for their service in the tabernacle. And instead of an allotment of land, the tabernacles, because before they had a permanent structure, they did like a lot of church plants like we did. They had to set up and take down, set up and take down. The tabernacle was mobile. Now we have a permanent place and we're so thankful to God, right? And through our giving and our savings, we paid for this renovation in cash. But now we got new needs, new bills, right? It says, instead of an allotment of land like all of you guys get, 
I'm going to give them the tithes from the entire land of Israel. That meant that the Levites would starve to death and be homeless if God's people didn't choose to obey. Mm, powerful. That's God's plan. Amen? Let's go to number three then. Third question. Sorry, I forgot to cover 1 Timothy 5. That, By the way, I purposely chose this from the New Testament to emphasize how much Paul said we live under the same principles of the old. He said elders, which was what you were called if you were a church leader in the early days. He said, those who do their work well should be respected and paid pennies. No, paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. For once again, he quotes this. The scripture says you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Don't make these poor people work 80 hours a week and not even get paid. And in another place, it says those who who work deserve their pay. Amen? If I promised my kids I'd pay them for a special job around the house and I tried to, you know, go back on that, oh, I'd hear it. You go and work at a new job for a whole week and they go, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have anything to pay you with. You're like, I quit. You know what I mean? You expect to get paid, right? So let's go to number three. Number three asks this as we close. How often, say how often, how often should we give? Is it once a year? Is it every day? Is it somewhere in between? It could be all of the above. Let me explain what I mean. Pull up this first slide here. The answer is first, say first, and foremost. Uh-uh, no, no. Try that again. And foremost. Yes, yes. In other words, you don't give to God when you're done saving, paying off debt, and spending everything you wanted. And then you're like, you know, I don't really know if I have anything left. But, oh, here's some coins, God. Way down, I forgot about these. I was going to use them later to get some bubble gum or something like they did 100 years ago. Uh, you know, I'm going to just kind of, oh, here, I'll, I'll throw you a little tip, God. That ain't how we give. No way. Come on. First and foremost. Do you know I pay God before I pay my taxes? And the government does not make the taxes optional. Nor do they wait and ask politely. They just go right into your paycheck and take those babies out. And then the withholding, you try withholding from them, you know, what they want all year. They'll nail you at the end of the year when you do your tax return. Or they'll withhold the overtax you paid and then they'll make you work your tail off and do a bunch of expensive tax return info to get the money back that was yours in the first place. Do you know God never does that? God has never reached into someone's pocket and pulled it out. Nor has he ever tried to threaten you or do anything like that. But he has told you, I leave it to you. I'm a gentleman, so I'm asking. But here's the standard. And then it's up to you. That's how God works. So go to this next slide. Again, back in that scripture, it says, honor the Lord, right? What does it say? Honor who? The Lord with your wealth and with what? The first and best, say first and best of all your income. In other words, when I get uh, either a regular paycheck that I'm scheduled to get or I get blessed and I get some extra monies, the first thing I do is subtract 10%. And then think, okay, God, what do you want me to do with the rest? How much more should I give? How much should be saved? How much should be this, that, or the other? It's not even a prayer for me. And you might be like, that's legalistic. We're not under the old covenant laws and requirements. No, you're not, thank goodness. But you're still required to live by God's principles for all of eternity. In fact, Jesus said you need to do it even more. He said the law may have said don't murder. Jesus goes, forget that. I say don't even want to murder. The law said you shouldn't commit adultery. Forget that. I say you shouldn't even be lusting after someone and having adultery in your mind, in your heart. All Jesus ever did was take the law to the next level or fulfill portions of it that could then be uh, done and over with. No, and I'll talk more about that next week as I really hone in on that part of the message about how to live out the law under the new covenant. So the first and best part, go to the next slide here. So if the answer is first and foremost, I'll tell you what the answer is not as we head to the finish line here. It's not when I can afford to. When can you afford to give? The answer is never. That's, that's 
Like my son said when I first taught him at like seven years of age about tithing and gave him ten dollars of an allowance and said, Okay, let's give that first dollar to God this Sunday. He's like, Wait, if I give a dollar, I only got nine. It's like nine is less than ten. And I'm like, I know, and that's the magic. God takes nine and makes it go further than ten. He's like, well, I don't see that. It's not my math class. You know, it was a little bit of a struggle. You don't wait till you can afford to give. If you've got ten dollars to your name, you can give one. If you got a million, you can give a hundred grand. I had a friend who made fifteen million a year in the NBA, and he was tithing one point five million and then some. You imagine writing a check for one point five million? You know, uh, uh, what's his name that makes all of the famous movies about African American culture and things? Tyler Perry. It's one of the richest celebrities out there. I'm talking. 50, 100, 200 million, some crazy amount of money. He said, I give 10% off, the, off of everything. That's so, those are some big checks. Wouldn't mind having Tyler in my church. So, <laughs> not when we can afford to, number two. Not when we remember to. You shouldn't have to be reminded every Sunday. We don't do it to remind you. We do it to celebrate with you and to offer a little two-minute teaching on it so that you never forget. Amen. But most of the people who are the best givers in our church end up giving during the week even because they're thinking, eh, I, got, I got paid, I need to give. Not when you're reminded to, as I said a moment ago, and not, put the last one up, when you're inspired to. You know, one of the biggest cop-outs that the New Testament Christian will give is, I don't feel led. What exactly does that mean? I don't feel led to stop sleeping with my girlfriend outside of marriage. I don't feel led. Well, says who? Says your emotions, your feelings? Well, when was that the law and the guidance? No, God's word is crystal clear on stuff. There's many of things in the Bible you don't need to feel led to do. It just says do them. Love your neighbor. Do not commit murder or adultery. You don't need to feel led not to do those things. Just don't do them. Amen? Now, there are moments where it is a judgment call. And you're praying and you're asking God to give you a sign or whatever. We're going to do one. I think the fifth book that we'll work on next year, hopefully, is uh, how to discern God's will for your life or God's will by the book. It's going to be really cool about the five ways that the Bible teaches you to discern God's will in priority order. But the first one, I'll let you know, top of the five, the Word of God. So if the Word of God already said it, you don't need to pray about it. Just do it. Amen? So not when we're inspired to. And I think that's my last one. Is that the last one I had up there? Oh, yeah, that one, when we feel willing to. I, I thought there was that last one I had on there, so I didn't look at my notes. And that was because one of the things I've heard people say is, well, I saw a, a documentary on Netflix, or I saw this or that, or I went to a church, and I found out that they had in, the usher had stolen some money, or the church, one of the church staff had embezzled some money, so I'm never going to give again. Wow, Really? Okay, well, that means then that any time you've ever met or heard of a hypocrite Christian, you should not ever serve God because you met a hypocrite Christian. That's not an excuse. One time, Jory and I were giving of our sacrificial missionary income to a ministry that later was proven to have mismanaged their funds. And I was even given a chance, if I wanted to, to press to get a refund out of the penalties they were paying. And I never asked for it. You know why? Because I was giving to God. Amen? Not because that was right, but because I was given to God. So go to the summary here. Summary is this. God wants us to give like he does. As his steward, by learning how much, to whom, and how often we should give. Amen? And I had to breeze through a lot of this. So I'm going to go into more detail next week. And even then, it won't cover everything that's in this book. I hope you get a copy for yourself. Amen? Father, I pray the same prayer I've been praying now for weeks, that we will have a stewardship revolution in our church where we start by recognizing everything we have is from you. We start learning to stay out of debt, save, and budget what we have. And then we become systematic, generous, amazing, powerful givers in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise God. We hope you enjoyed this message from All People Christian Church. For more information about our church or for more sermons like these, please check us out on the web at allpeoplecc.com.